Good morning. If you'll take your red hymnals and turn to 600, we'll sing that first verse as our call to worship. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. Welcome to Mount Bethel United Methodist Church. And uh, we're delighted that you're here with us this morning and worshiping with us. Uh, we also want to extend a warm welcome to everyone who's joined us as well um, through Facebook or through our FM, and F FM transmitter. We're glad that, uh, that we're able to gather together in that way as well. If you'll please stand and take your Methodist hymnal, turn to 133. We'll sing all three verses. 133. What a fellowship! What a joy divine! seated. As we come to our prayer time this morning, I want to be uh, mindful of everyone that's there on the prayer list in the bulletin. Please take a, a look at that. Is there, first of all, is there any report relative to any of those names we need to know about this morning? Okay, if not, are there any names that need to be added to that prayer list? Okay, Royce Trousdo. Thank you, Ruth. Anyone else? Okay, if not, would you bow with me, please? And let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you today, and we're grateful for this opportunity to gather in your house and to worship. 
Thank you for a beautiful, sunshiny day and another day of life, another day full of opportunity to experience life with you and life with each other. God, we come to you this morning grateful for all provisions that you place in our life each day. Thank you, God, for walking with us and for enabling life abundant and life eternal. Thank you, Father, this morning for your grace and your mercy, for salvation through Jesus, for the forgiveness of our sins, for hope in this life. God, we thank you for bringing us to faith in you and faith in Christ. Lord, we thank you this morning for this sacred time of worship, time to set the world aside, time to focus completely on you. Time when we just need to dial our attention in to to your truth, to your word, to your worship. Father, you're worthy. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our time, our attention, our effort. God, help us today just to pour ourselves out as a sacrifice to you, wholly surrendered to who you want us to be in this minute and in, in, in all other times. God, we invite you into this service this morning because we're not powerful in and of ourselves to do anything worthy of your praise. But God, we invite you to be here today to anoint this time for your purpose, your honor, your glory. Lord, we invite you to teach us. We invite you to draw us close to you so that we might learn of you and learn to love you more. God, as we gather today, we're also mindful of those around us who can't be here for whatever reason that exist with them, whatever their circumstances are. God, you know the situation. You know the need. We ask that in each of those situations, God, that you would, would be present and close, that they would feel comfort knowing that you're there and that they would find strength and peace, comfort and healing through you. Father, we pray this morning for, also for, the, for, for our world around us and our nation around us. God, we witness a world that's starving for you. We witness a world that's starving for your truth. God, help, help our nation and our world to, to see and understand that you are the way, the truth, and the life. That it all makes sense through you. God, there are times when we pray that we struggle to find the right words to speak, the right words to say. In your scripture, Jesus teaches us exactly what those perfect words are. And as a congregation, we pray them together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sometimes it's <clears throat> extremely hard to understand potential value of a thorn. Um, another image I think that will connect real well with you, especially, well, not this time of year, it's probably a little late, but a few weeks back, maybe a month ago, two months ago or so, um, probably most of you have gone out someplace around here on your farm or someone's farm or somewhere, and you've tried to collect a few blackberries. If, if, you, if you can't get aggravated about a thorn anywhere else, <laughs> try picking blackberries. That'll do it for you. And it'll have you asking the question, uh, why? It's kind of like bugs, you know. Why was God, why was this necessary? 
<laughs> um, it is all part of his grand design. But it is difficult, it's very difficult to comprehend any value to a thorn. And it's probably one of my favorite passages of scripture. Right? It's one I get pulled into the deepest. It's one I get intrigued by most. Is reading the account in 2 Corinthians about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Now, you, you've heard, I'm sure you've heard countless messages about this. You've heard all kinds of things said about Paul's thorn in the flesh. One thing we are not going to do today is we're not going to try to predict or figure out what it was. Um, it, the Bible doesn't say. At best, uh, commentators and theologians can speculate on what they think it might have been. I think that's kind of beside the point. Um, we can just leave it at, at what it is, at what Scripture tells us it is. In particular, at what Paul told us it was. He just describes it as a thorn in the flesh. And I think as we read that and as we get into this, we can all connect. Because I think we can all pretty quickly identify, just as we identify with thorns on that rose bush and thorns in the blackberries and stuff like that, I think you and I probably connect, connect pretty quick about what our thorns are in our own life. And it, it, it's probably different than Paul's. But all of us deal with thorns in the flesh, and that's kind of what we want to deal with this morning, is the value of that, and specifically what it's intended to do. So let's go on this journey together. Let's begin by opening your Bibles to the 12th chapter of Paul's letter our second letter to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to deal specifically with the first 10 verses. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Okay. Let's read this together, and then we'll spend some time talking about what it says. Paul writes, Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man will I boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I shall not be foolish, for I shall be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this, so that no one may credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected. In weaknesses, in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Let's deal with verses 1 through 6 
first. In those six verses, Paul talks about the topic of boasting. Boasting is not something that most of us enjoy at all. We don't like to hear people boast, and most of us would not boast of ourselves. It's not in good taste. It's not socially really acceptable. It's kind of a turnoff if you're around somebody who spends a lot of time boasting of themselves. It's a little bit of a, okay, I've heard enough of that, and I want to move on, right? Paul writes about the topic of boasting, and he is his very first statement there in the first verse says, well, boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable. In those first six verses, he's actually having, having to boast of himself for just a few minutes. And there's a reason. In the church in Corinth at this particular time, just to give you a very short version of the story, they had a lot of influential religious leaders who were leading people, or maybe misleading people might be the more appropriate way to say, they were leading them in wrong directions. And they were doing so, they were gaining credibility because of the boasting they were doing about themselves. They were boasting of their own spiritual experiences, the, own, their, the, the things that had happened to them, their own spiritual gifts. They, they, they were uplifting themselves in order to, to, to gain credibility. Um, today, if you're on social media much, if you're on Facebook, if you're on Instagram, uh, TikTok, and all these other forms of social media, there's a popular thing going on, and it's where people actually become influencers on social media. They get paid to influence people to buy product. Um, they're sought out. I've seen people who, who I've seen in the comments in social media where they're actually approached. Uh, you know, some person will be approached to, hey, uh, we'd like to talk to you about helping us sell our product. And so we got a whole world going on in social media where influencing, influencers has become kind of its own industry. People are getting paid just to post stuff. <laughs> you know, here, you know, sell this dress for us. You know, and, and, and people take pictures of themselves wearing certain clothing and then they tell people where they can buy it or where they can get it. And the seller of the clothing actually pays this person just to post pictures of themselves on social media to sell their product. Um, some people are making incredible amounts of money doing that, just as influencers on social media. Corinth had its influencers. <laughs> uh, not quite social media influencers, okay? But there were influential religious leaders who were who were able to be so influential and actually leading people in the wrong directions because they were boasting of their own credentials. And Paul had to break into this somehow. The way he did it, he had to boast of himself. Because the, the man that he writes about here that was drawn up into the third heaven that was drawn up into paradise, that in verse 4 was uh, caught up in para paradise to hear inexpressible words that a man isn't permitted to speak. He's writing of himself. It was his modest way to boast. He talks about, I know a man who was... 14 years ago, drawn up into paradise and was able to see and to hear things that I can't even talk about. And he wrote it in the third person because he didn't want to draw undue attention to himself, but he is that man. He did it because he needed to remind people of his credentials 
in this, in, this, in this setting in Corinth where people were being wrongly influenced, he needed something to, to, to bolster his credibility in the way he was trying to lead them in the gospel. And he tells them about something that happened to him that he, if you pay attention to the way the scripture reads, it happened 14 years ago. He'd sat on this for 14 years and not told anybody that it happened. I like him already. <laughs> because he kept this wonderful, glorious thing that God had done for him and through him in his life, he kept it a secret until it was time that it absolutely had to be told. It speaks of his integrity. It speaks of his character. It speaks of his authenticity in his ministry. Something else, very quickly, just as a matter of frame of reference or perspective. After Most of you probably remember Paul's conversion, right? You remember how that happened. You remember he's, a, he's on the road going to persecute Christians, actually, when God shook him up and appeared to him, actually took his sight for a brief period of time. But he was saved, and he believed in Christ. And he became a minister of the gospel of Christ instead of, 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 a, of a person who would persecute Christianity. How many of you know that Paul spent quite a period of time in isolation after that? I think it's recorded in Galatians. He actually went away and he spent some time just by himself. I forget how many years it was, but it was a, it was a pretty lengthy period of time. It was a period of time in his life, if you do a little study on it, you do a little reading on it, you'll find that in that time, that was when God was shaping him to be the minister that he became. It was also during that time when he was alone by himself with God that he became that man drawn up into paradise, into the third heaven, and heard the words that are now not speakable and saw what he was able to see. But he never told anybody it happened until now and he spoke it not for the purpose of drawing attention to himself but he spoke it so that he might have the credibility to go ahead and do what God wanted him to do to be able to stay and to speak with credibility the things that the people of Corinth needed to hear so he boasts out of necessity But that takes us to the thorn. And that gets us to the thing this morning we want to focus on for ourselves. Paul says, and where you start to understand that the person he's writing about is himself, is in verse 7. And it's where this whole text gets real. That was his basis for boasting. Corinth was experiencing... Uh, the, the wrong influences from religious authorities boasting of their spiritual experiences and gifts. Some of you may remember from you know time you spent in Corinthians as well. They also had tendencies to abuse the spiritual gifts. They had, they had a tendency to use those for things that God never intended them to be used for to start with. So he needed to validate his authority by telling of his own experience some 14 years prior when he was alone with God shortly after his conversion, and he does so with the right reason and with immense modesty. But then he gets to the thorn. In verse 7, he says, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me to keep me from exalting myself. Think of the sweetness of the rose or the sweetness of the fruit. The thorn's necessary to protect its best. Paul needed a thorn to protect the best of himself. Because what happens when you start to exalt yourself? What does the Bible teach us about 
pride. It comes directly before a what? A fall. Paul didn't need to get caught up in what God had done for him in that alone time 14 years prior, being drawn to a place where he heard words that were not speakable. If any man had a reason to brag, if any man had a reason to boast, if any man had a reason to stick out his chest and be proud of what he had, had, had been a part of, it was Paul. But God had his way of keeping Paul's mind right and keeping him in check. Now, what we see here about the thorn, let's, let's pay careful attention about what, what the Bible does say and doesn't say about the thorn. It does not say God gave him that thorn. It doesn't say God sent it. What you can infer is that God permitted it. Because of the greatness of the revelations and for the reason to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. What are your thorns this morning? One of our first thoughts I want you to, to frame up this morning in, in context of how this is important to you is that whatever thorns you have, whatever thorns you're going through, first of all, don't be angry with God because he's probably not the one who sent them. He is indeed the one who allowed them to happen. But if he allowed it to happen, there's a reason. He had a reason with Paul. He was protecting Paul's best. He was protecting the best of who Paul was. He's protecting the best of who you are and who I am. There was a thorn given to him in the flesh. And it's even described as a messenger of Satan. I read that phrase and I kept digging and I kept trying to figure out what what is that what does that imply? Well, that's in a spiritual realm. When you start talking about a message of Satan, it doesn't say it was Satan himself, but it says a messenger of Satan. And some of the commentaries and so forth um, insinuated or or actually spoke that this is perhaps some kind of you know demonic influence that kept working in the situation. Now. What that means is that it was a situation that Satan could use to attack him. If you think about that, the thorns that you and I experience, that's the spiritual battle that takes place. Satan tries to take those circumstances and take those situations and get us to react wrongly to whatever's happened. One of his first, probably his first strategies is to make us mad at God for something we shouldn't be mad at God for. It's not God's fault to get with. And so when we read the phrase in here that, that this, this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan buffeted him, it said to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. It was an ongoing spiritual battle for Paul. Whatever the thorn was, Satan's messenger could use to try to wedge his way into Paul's right thinking about the God that he served. Can't we identify with that? <laughs> Our thorns that we experience, the, the things that we go through that might equate to Paul's thorn in the flesh, Satan tries to use those against us or tries to use them and give us a, a mindset of a wrong thought. I want to share a, 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 a personal thorn that I've witnessed just in the past couple of weeks. It's been painful to watch. But our nephew had a stillborn baby week before last. That's a thorn. It's a thorn in the flesh. It's something nobody on this earth wants to have to endure. But a person who goes through that can take that that happens like that. And depending on how you react to it, it can be something that either draws you closer to God or if Satan's messenger has his way, it'll push you further away.
What's your thorn? What are your thorns? What are you dealing with? First lesson up for us in this is that God doesn't necessarily give us or send those thorns, but sometimes he allows things like that to happen to keep us from exalting ourselves. And he's got a greater plan. He has a greater purpose at work in what's going on. Because of the greatness of Paul's experience, because of the glory of the revelations, he was given a thorn to protect him against exalting himself. Thorns protect the beauty of the rose and the sweetness of the orange. God is protecting the beauty and the sweetness of who you are. And he's making you more of who he wants you to be. And that establishes a context for how we deal with thorns in our life. We can learn that through Paul's example. In these thorns or weaknesses, we find the sufficiency of grace. That's the next thing I wanted us to focus on. Because a lot of times those thorns that we experience bring us to the end of ourselves. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been at the end of yourself? Have you ever been in a situation or place where there's nothing you can do to control the outcome? There's not a thing you can do to change what just happened or what is about to happen. Sometimes it's a diagnosis. Sometimes it's a loss of a job. Sometimes it's that a friendship or a relationship gets shattered. There's all kinds of thorns in this world. There's all kinds of things that can happen because we live in a broken world. We live in a world that has not been perfect since Adam and Eve ate the apple. It was corrupted at that point. When we're at the end of ourselves, we must find something that, that can get us past that. And what we see in the story with Paul and in the scripture is that Paul decided because of his thorn in verse 8 to ask God to take it away. Well, that's a common response for all of us, right? Verse 8 says, Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Most of us don't stop it three times. Most of us spend a lot of time in prayer asking God and telling God what to do. Instead of just coming to grips with the thorn, realize it might be that God's trying to make us more beautiful. <laughs> it might be that he's trying to make us sweeter or protect what is beautiful about us or what is sweet about us. Paul's response was just like our response. Take it away, God, please. Three times he asked God. God's response is recorded in verse 9. Paul writes, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Awesome. <laughs> my grace is sufficient. In, 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 in our thorns or our weaknesses, we find the sufficiency of grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It's his, it's his ability to accept through Christ's sacrifice, our imperfections. It's his ability in grace to perfect power in our weaknesses. And that puts in a wonderful perspective how we deal with thorns in our life. That's God at work. Let him do his work. Find Sufficiency for when we're at the end of ourselves. What does sufficiency mean? Well, sufficiency, if you look up, if, if you look up the, just the mere definition, the Webster definition of sufficiency, it means adequate for the purpose. There's a lot of times you and I can't be adequate for the purpose. We don't have the power to do it. But where our strength ends, God's begins. Where our weaknesses stop us and cause us to fail, his power is perfected in how we are weak. We find the sufficiency of grace through the thorns in our life. 
we're perfected. In our weakness, we are perfected in his strength. Because the power of Christ it can then dwell in us. Paul writes there in verse 9 of the sufficiency of grace and power being perfected in weakness. He writes these words, and listen to this carefully because we don't need to miss the, the, the heart of what he's writing here. He says, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. He doesn't want to speak. He doesn't want to boast of what happened to him 14 years ago when he was alone with God and drawn into paradise to experience and see and hear things that he can't even retell. He doesn't want to boast about that. He says, no, he says, most gladly, verse 9, I would rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. What are your thorns? What are mine? Do we have Paul's heart here? Can we look at our own circumstances and our own thorns, those places where we're at the end of ourselves? Can we look at those things and say, I'd rather boast about that, I'd rather boast about that weakness in my life so that the power of Christ can be perfected in me? close this thought out. Let's look at the last verse in his account of this. Because he hits another key word. He talks about contentment. It's an odd place to write about contentment. <laughs> when, when, when you're talking about, when you spend all this time talking about the thorn in my flesh, it seems rather odd to go quickly to how content I am. Because most of us can't spell contentment when the thorns are at work, right? When you're trying to pull those blackberries out of those vines, how content are you with that situation? When you're trying, <laughs> when you're trying to, you know, even I was out there this morning trying to clip that rose and trying not to hurt myself in the process, right? Think of those people who have to pick the oranges off the tree. I didn't realize that was an issue until I started reading about it. People who harvest oranges and orange groves, that's not, a, not just out there pulling fruit off the tree. A little bit of danger that goes along with it. It's a weird place to be talking about being content. Well, listen to what Paul has to say in the middle of all this. His, his statement, verse 10, Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. What a statement. What a time to make it. Sometimes your world's falling in around you. Sometimes things are not going right. Sometimes the circumstances are broken and busted. What a time to say, I'm well content with what's going on. <laughs> I'm well content with the weaknesses that I have. I'm well content to be at the end of myself. I'm content with insults, I'm content with distresses, I am content with persecutions, and I'm content with difficulties. For Christ's sake. And Paul sums it up with the last thing he says there. The reason he's content, he says, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When he is at his weakest, he is at his most powerful. Because he's laid it down himself. And he's put it in the hands of God, who's all capable and all powerful. Remember, one of the characteristics of God is he's omnipotent. That means all powerful. We're at the end of ourselves. We're right where he can pick it up. He may not take the thorn away. His answer may be, my grace is sufficient. This circumstance won't change, but everything will be okay. You ever had that answer before? Absolutely. You ever been in a place where that was God's answer? I I'm sorry, but I'm not going to heal you of that. 
I'm not going to take that away. I'm not going to change it. But my grace is sufficient. My grace is adequate for the purpose. And in your weakness, I can perfect you in strength. It is, a, it is the place of contentment that we need to reach. Contentment implies, by its definition, to be a state of happiness and satisfaction. Oh, that we could be truly happy and satisfied just knowing that God's grace is sufficient even if our circumstance doesn't change. Because the upside of that, the beautiful side of that, is the, the thorn is a necessity to protect us. The thorn is a necessity to protect the beauty and the sweetness of who we are and who God wants to lead us to be. When we're weak is when we are truly at our greatest strength in Him. I hope you find Paul's account to be encouraging to you today. Wherever you sit, whatever thorn you're dealing with. And there may, be, there may be multiple thorns. But don't lose hope. Don't despair. Don't look at the situation and think that I'm at the end of myself. I'm so weak. And, and don't, don't lose your contentment. Don't lose your, your, your happiness and your satisfaction with your life. What you feel like you may have lost control over God is in complete control of. Okay? What surprised you didn't surprise him. What you look at and say, oops, I didn't mean for that to happen, he looks at it and says, I knew that was going to happen. And it's all going to be okay. You may not understand it in this life. It may take paradise before I can tell you about things that can't be spoken. Paul chose only one time to say anything about those revelations, and he did so out of necessity, not because he wanted to exalt himself. He wanted to establish his credibility to speak the right truth and for people to hear what he had to say. But he quickly, at that point, level set everything by saying, because of the greatness of the revelations, I was given authority to keep me from thinking too much of myself and from disrupting the beauty of who I am and who God wants me to be. That's the purpose of the thorn in the flesh. Just like the thorn on the rose and the thorn on the orange and the citrus trees has purpose, those thorns in your life and mine have a purpose to protect. A purpose to protect us in the process of who God's wanting to make us and who He wants us to be. I hope you know that that contentment this morning. I hope you know the source of that contentment. I would encourage you if you haven't come to that saving place in Jesus that this time of invitation would be the time when you, when you open your heart to God in that way and you ask Him to be your Savior and your Lord, your sustainer when thorns come your Amanda's going to come and play. Ruth's going to come back and lead our final songs. Altar is open if you need to come pray or pray where you are. I would be glad to pray with you if you need someone to do that. Um, hope, hopefully you find encouragement in the truth of God's word this morning and in the story Paul shared with us about his own thorn in the flesh. Um, Ruth, thank you so much for leading our music this morning. As you all can hear my voice, is shaky and if I had tried to sing on top of everything else I don't know if I could have even continued to speak so thank you for doing that if you'll please stand and turn to 357 we'll sing the first and last verse <clears throat> just as I am
Just as I am thy love unknown Hath broken every barrier down Now to be thine, yea, thine Alone, O Lamb of God, I come Our sending forth will be the first, oh no, the chorus only of uh, 338. <clears throat> 